to our guests. Tonight, we'll present two UW science students who will enlighten us on their research. First, we have Ian Johnson, grad student in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, who will talk about the pulse plasma thruster, a rocket made for microsatellites. Please offer up a warm welcome for Ian Johnson. Thank you very much for being here. I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington, looking to graduate later this year, 2014. Uh, I had the opportunity to take this uh, Engage class, and uh, some of my friends who were in the department had previously taken it and just had absolute 100% positive feedback about it. And so I've really enjoyed it, and I'm uh, looking forward to this opportunity to speak to you guys here at Town Hall. We've been sending satellites up into Earth's atmosphere, uh, the moon, further out for the last 50 years or so. But in the last 10 years, 15 years, there's been a, a massive shift in our, how we're exploring space, and in particular going to very, very small satellites. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that today. Whenever I give a presentation on space exploration, uh, the first question that usually comes up is, why are we going to space? Isn't this too expensive? Isn't, aren't there things we should be focusing on here on the planet? And my answer to that is usually some variant of, this is what comes next. Uh, imagine if the Europeans had never crossed the ocean over here to America, or if Lewis and Clark had never gone west to find the Pacific Ocean, or if no one had ever followed them. We wouldn't be here in Seattle today. The Russians started the space race by launching the Sputnik satellite, and 12 years later, uh, the Americans finished it by landing on the moon. This sense of exploration is still going on today, uh, even though we may not know, with private companies across the United States, uh, school-aged children, when they meet an astronaut, it was evidence uh, just a few years ago with tens of thousands of, of entries to name the Mars rover. Speaking of Mars, our closest friend, We've sent only a handful of, of satellites and rovers there. Uh, the same with Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. And what about further away? We're nowhere close to going anywhere near another star or another galaxy. Looking a little closer at home, we have a number of satellites in orbit around the planet that we use every single day of our lives. Every single person on this planet has a smartphone, has a GPS in their car. We use these satellites to predict hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, all kinds of things. Uh, space exploration is all around us every day, and that's why I'm focusing on what I'm focusing on. Traditional satellites, what we have sent up for the majority of our time exploring off the planet, are massive. They are absolutely huge. Uh, this is one of the GPS satellites that Boeing made. It's currently orbiting around 500 to 600 uh, miles above our head right now. GPS is something that I use to get down here tonight on my phone. Uh, I'll use this weekend when I'm traveling up to Bellingham. Uh, it's something that we use every single day. Satellites like this, their, their sheer size, even here on Earth, we know that larger things, heavier things are harder to move, and that's certainly the case when we get up into space. Something this size will take a vast amount of money to put up into space and then to actually upkeep once it's up there. So in the mid-1990s, some professors at the University of Cal, at Stanford, and at CIT came together and said, what if we can go smaller? Something like this isn't feasible for a, a college to put up into space, but what if we can make something smaller, lighter, less expensive, uh, that way, our graduate students, our undergraduate students, would actually be able to explore space on their own in a budget and a timeline that they'll be able to handle. And they came up with what's called the CubeSat. It's a satellite small enough that you can hold in your hand. Currently, humans have launched around 200 of them. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 33 of them launched from the space station just a month ago. Uh, these are a, a brand new type of satellite, and we have not just college students, but high school students and middle school students, obviously with the guidance of uh, businesses and, and governments, uh, creating these. And, and it's really allowing more people to explore space. It, it's not just 
those companies with massive amounts of money that we always hear about in the news. Universities across, not just the United States, but across this planet uh, are using these satellites and sending them up into orbit. One of the problem with these, though, is that it's great that they're so small, universities can send them up, but it's hard to do much with something that's that particular size. You can't put a lot of fuel inside of it, uh, it can't transmit very far, the solar panels are, are fairly small, so there's not a whole lot of power it can generate. And that's one of the major advantages that a large satellite has over us. And one of the things that I've been focusing on for the last four years of my graduate school work is how do we move satellites around space? The, the typical fashion for making this happen is you're going to throw out fuel at the back of a spacecraft. That fuel is going to have some mass. That fuel is going to have some speed. And if you guys can remember your high school physics classes, uh, something with mass moving at a certain speed or velocity is going to create a force in the opposite direction and get the spacecraft to move forward. So a big fire comes out the back, spacecraft goes forward. When we think about rocket science, we think about the space shuttle. SpaceX has been in the news recently with their Dragon capsules and their Falcon rockets. Uh, the space shuttle in particular, you have that massive orange fuel tank in the middle, the two smaller white fuel tanks on either side. We have a huge flame that comes out the bottom, massive amounts of smoke. The space shuttle goes through enough fuel to fill up a swimming pool every 30 seconds. Obviously, you're not going to be able to fit that much fuel on a small satellite. Uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin down in Kent, uh, Aerojet over in Redmond, all these companies more or less use the same principle. Massive amounts of fuel coming out at a certain speed, the spacecraft's going to move forward. What my lab's looking at is what if we can turn that around? We know that we need some mass of fuel and some speed of fuel to move the spacecraft. So instead of using a lot of fuel, what about increasing the speed? And the reason for using less fuel and increasing the speed is that, as I said before, CubeSats are tiny. You just can't fit that much fuel inside of one. Back in the 60s, the Russians were the, the first uh, country to launch what's called the pulse plasma thruster. And this particular thruster is incredibly tiny. I think we compared it to a quarter up here in this image. It's been around since the 60s. It's been more or less the same ever since then. Uh, the general operation of this particular rocket or this particular thruster is not overly complicated and something that most people are, are able to grasp. We're going to take electricity and we're going to run it between these two pieces of metal. Electricity, there's nothing overly fancy about it. We use 60 watt light bulbs at home or if you go to the store and want to save a little bit of money, there's some of the new 10 watt and 15 watt light bulbs. Instead of 60 watts, we're going to run hundreds of thousands of watts for a very short time between these two pieces, uh, between these two pieces of metal. It's going to heat up the solid fuel that's inside of it. And as we all know, when we heat up something solid, it becomes a liquid. When we heat up a liquid, it becomes a gas. What happens when we heat up a gas, though? It becomes this fourth state of matter that not many people talk about. It's simply called a plasma. And all it does is you take the electrons and the ions that are inside of an atom and you strip them apart from each other. What's exciting about the plasma is that it can move very, very quickly, much faster than gas can. So we're going to create this plasma cloud from our solid fuel. We're going to accelerate or push that fuel out the back of the spacecraft. And then, obviously, the fourth step is that the spacecraft goes the other direction. At the U, the University of Washington, we have a number of small vacuum chambers. And this is one of them. Uh, this is where we test our particular pulse plasma thruster. And uh, we can see the thruster over here on the left side of the screen. When we fire this, we have a nice uh, plume of plasma particles that are uh, thrown out of this thruster. And we're able to use very high-speed cameras to be able to take these pictures. Typical pulse plasma thrusters, ever since the 1960s or so, have used various elements or various types of plastic as their fuel. Teflon has been the primary fuel. It's something a lot of people use to cook with at home. It's that non-stick substance you might use to make potatoes or uh, carrots, vegetables of some kind. Not me, because I'm in college and I don't eat vegetables, but other people who use vegetables. Uh, also epoxy, which is just a fancy type of glue. But they're all various types of plastics. And this is what's been used for pulse plasma thrusters for ages. My professor, who 
hopefully is watching this live streaming at the moment, is a crazy old Australian guy. And he came into the lab one day and said, maybe we don't have to use plastic. Maybe we don't have to use Teflon. Our lab being part of the Earth and Space Science Department, we have rocks and minerals and all kinds of things just laying around. So we started trying out a few of them. Uh, a few of the minerals that are commonly found on Earth uh, in asteroids, uh, chalcopyrite, bismuth sulfide, olivine. Chalcopyrite in particular, I, I'd never heard about it before. It's what fool's gold is. And so my professor brought in this rock that it was a chunk of gold. He handed it to me and I said, no, 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 I'm a graduate student. I can't afford that. Uh, but it turns out it's incredibly cheap. Uh, we also have various types of metals, lead, bismuth, gallium. Gallium is a really exciting metal in that its melting point or where it becomes a solid to a liquid is very, very low. It's 85 degrees Fahrenheit, so you're able to melt it in your hand. There's a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, someone uh, serves their guest tea and they hand them a spoon made out of gallium. So they mix in the sugar and whatnot into the tea and then they pull out the spoon and the bottom half of the spoon isn't there anymore. Uh, so a lot of really exciting metals that are fairly common on Earth. Uh, so we tested a few of these. We didn't see a drastic improvement. And then my advisor, as he's crazy and old, said, well, let's try something else. So I've labeled this, this group other. Uh, we have some volcanic ash that some of our professors in the department study. And then we had a big chunk of sulfur. And it turns out, and I want to draw your attention to sulfur, bismuth sulfide, and chalcopyrite. All three of these have some element of sulfur inside of them. So we put these in our vacuum chamber and we put them on our thrust stand and we we're able to measure the thrust. And thrust is how much the spacecraft is going to move for what you put into it. So it's the same as the different types of fuels that we have in our cars. If you put in unleaded, uh, premium, supreme, plus, diesel, whatever you want to call it, depending on what type of fuel you put in will depend on how far the spacecraft moves. So for us, because we're very limited in our space, we want to put in whatever fuel we can to get the most thrust or the most spacecraft movement out of the thruster. And so Teflon is what's been used forever, is over here on the left side of the screen. And as we move to the right, we get more thrust or more spacecraft movement out for the same amount of energy in. And you might notice that those three substances that have sulfur in them are far on the, the right-hand side of the screen, meaning they have the most thrust. So they'll be the most efficient fuel type to use. And as far as we can find, no one's used a sulfur pulse plasma thruster before. No one's even considered a sulfur pulse plasma thruster before. And we can get twice as much thrust out uh, compared to Teflon for the same amount of energy or power in, into the device. So imagine if we're driving our car. I'm driving, say, from Seattle to, I don't know, Los Angeles and I need to re refuel my car when I hit the bottom, or I don't know, let's say Portland or so. Imagine if instead of just driving from Seattle to Portland and then having to regas up the car, I can drive from Seattle to the northern part of California. That would save me a drastic amount of money. And that's what going to these different fuel types enable us to do. So this is great. We have this sulfur pulse plasma thruster. I can get my PhD now and move on. Life is exciting. But we really want to put this up into space. And this is where the hard part comes into. These are large satellites. They're fairly expensive. Scientists, engineers, NASA, private companies, they're not going to let you fly something until you can prove that it'll actually work up in space. The problem with that being that you can't prove that something's going to work in space until you actually put it up there in space. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg paradox. Our department, uh, a couple of our professors, Michael McCarthy and Bob Holsworth, have a tremendous amount of experience launching things on balloons into the high atmosphere. So we said, all right, if we can't get into space, let's do the next best thing and get close to space. Uh, so I believe I have to click this video. Technology is very confusing. Last year, we went out to Moses Lake, Washington, the Grant County Airport, Exciting place, Moses Lake, Washington, if you've never been there, a lot going on. And we took our, pulse, our sulfur pulse plasma thruster and we put it up on this balloon. And we said, all right, we're going to show these people that we can actually launch this thing up at the tops of our atmosphere and maybe that'll prove to them that we can put it up into space. I don't know if we have sound on this video, um, but if you did, you'd be able to hear the, the uh, sulfur PPT firing. We get up, this is about 20 miles or 30 kilometers 
up above Earth. Uh, so fairly high, nowhere actual close to space. Space is more like 200 miles up. Uh, we had two cameras. This is our view facing down. This is my favorite part of the video when the balloon actually pops. A nice smooth flight up and then everything goes to hell on the way back down. It tumbles like this for about a half hour until we go to our last camera where clearly we should have put a slightly larger parachute on the device. <laughs> Landed in the middle of a, I don't know, a wheat field or something, whatever they have out in Moses Lake, Washington. I'm going to insult some people from Moses Lake, but that's all right. Uh, so we flew this, we showed this video, we wrote up some reports to NASA, and we, actually able to got, we were actually able to get money back uh, to fund this project, uh, which is incredibly exciting. And we've, we're writing more grants as we speak, and we're actually planning another atmospheric balloon flight uh, over in Moses Lake at the end of May. Uh, we have a number of undergraduate students and a couple graduate students as well working on this. Uh, the undergrads who worked on this project last year said it was the absolute highlight of their time at the UW, uh, this, this hour flight that we had. So we're really excited to be able to do this again, not just for the experience uh, for these students, uh, but also because this is getting us one step closer to moving this particular thruster up into space. So we have this thruster, life is good, NASA is throwing us a little bit of money. We actually need to build a satellite that it's going to go on as well. F January 1st of this year is when we started this CubeSat program uh, here at the UW. And so in addition to the thruster, which you can see I'm holding in my hand up there, this, this thing is tiny. Uh, we're building out the various computers, the electronics, the hardware for it, and just yesterday we got the, the structure or the, the outer skeleton of this satellite uh, built and designed. Uh, another student by the name of Michael Pfaff was the one who built it, and I decided to take a picture of it uh, just to show just how small it is in front of our vacuum chamber. Uh, so we're really excited for this, testing's moving along, and we think we're going to be able to finish this and actually launch the device before the end of the decade, uh, 2020, which means that the University of Washington will be able to go into space, or Ian Johnson will be able to go into space, uh, say before the light rail gets to Northgate, or the light rail gets over to the east side of the lake. Um, so we're incredibly excited about how far this project's moving forward. Uh, with the Sulfur Plus plasma thruster and also the CubeSat that we're building up entirely at the UW, uh, teams composed of mainly undergraduate students, a lot of juniors and seniors, and not just from the sciences. We have art majors, we have history majors, uh, English majors, CHID majors. It's really exciting the people that we're able to bring forward to work on this project. You hear, you can build a satellite that'll go up into space and everyone seems to want to get in on the project. Uh, so we're incredibly excited about this. 2020 is our deadline. We'll see if we actually make it or not. Um, but this is what I've been working on for the last four years and what I hopefully will be working on only for the next couple of months until I graduate, unless my professor keeps me there until the end of time, I suppose. So thank you guys very much for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Oh, do you have to go up to a microphone? Possibly. Presumably for... Technology. It should just work for you. There we go. Okay. Presumably for every fuel, there will be a, a satellite size that's ideal for it. Because there's a certain amount of even large and small, there's no natural reason the bigger the satellite, the more fuel you need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have uh, identified some new fuels, uh, is there an ideal size that you would take? So that's an interesting question. And I would actually turn that question around. It's not an ideal size, but an ideal length of mission. So let's say your satellite only needs to be up in space for half a year or a year, then you only want a fuel that's going to last for half a year or a year. For some of these larger satellites that need to be up there for 20 years or 50 years, they need fuel that can last for 20 years or 50 years. Uh, for us, for these smaller uh, CubeSat satellites, uh, most of them uh, only live for a month, maybe two months. And by going to uh, a sulfur fuel, you're able to extend the lifetime of that satellite out. So if we can get twice as much movement out of the satellite, that should mean that we're able to have those satellites survive for twice as long. So a couple of questions. Um, one, what's the longevity of the 
fuel, how long does it last? What do you use these little satellites for? And three, if everybody and their brother can launch one of them, aren't you worried about a whole plethora of space junk floating around? <laughs> <laughs> to answer that last question first, there actually already is a plethora of space junk floating around. Uh, NASA released a report last year that said it'll be unsafe for humans to go into space. Uh, I think it was 2030 uh, with our current rate uh, of space travel. And that's one of the things that they're spending a lot of money on, uh, a ridiculous amount of money on in. How can we remove some of this space junk that we have up there? Uh, for the other questions, what do we use these satellites for? Anything you can really think of. Uh, give a, a college student the ability to put a, a satellite up in space and they'll come up with some crazy idea for it. But exactly what I mentioned before, if we can put up say twice as many satellites, we'll be able to cover more of the globe with cameras to be able to better, uh, say, image uh, the Arctic ice retreating or hurricanes forming, uh, better communication with cell phones, with GPS, uh, a, a whole host of things. And in, in addition to that, if we can get more of these satellites, maybe that means not just around Earth, but we're sending them to the moon, sending them to Mars. Uh, I mean, the number of satellites that we've sent to Mars, I, I think, what, 20, maybe 30 at most, uh, that are actually doing anything out there. Uh, and if we can send something that is in the size of my hand, we'll be able to not just double that number, but maybe uh, times 10 or times 100 the number of satellites that we can get out there. So the use is really anything that you could possibly think about it and just expanding our capabilities that are up there right now. Sure, so I, I think as I kind of said to the first question, the fuel will last as long as we still have fuel there. Obviously, the smaller the satellite, the less fuel you can have. If we're able to get more performance out of the fuel, that means the satellite's going to be able to last longer and go further. So with sulfur, we're able to get twice as much thrust out of it as Teflon. So let's say we want to travel the same distance, we can do that for twice as long than we could have with Teflon. Or vice versa, in the same time frame, we can go twice as far. Uh, so most of these satellites are on the order of a couple of months, simply because they don't have propulsion systems or thrusters on them. If we can actually put one of these sulfur pulse plasma thrusters up there, uh, we'd be able to extend that from a couple of months to a, a, a couple of years or so. more than the University of Washington can do. Um, typically, the, well, the way that most CubeSats have been launched so far is they've hitched a ride on something else. So NASA or Aerojet or SpaceX launches a large rocket for some satellite. The satellite maybe takes up 98% of the space on that rocket. In the other remaining 2%, we're able to throw in a couple of CubeSats. Uh, a lot of the missions to the space station have had 10 or 20 CubeSats on them. And really, I mean, these satellites, if you can fit them in the size of your hand, it doesn't take that much space to put 10 or 20 of them up there. And, and can the satellite itself, with the solar panels on, generate enough power to really do much? Surprisingly, they can. Uh, with the advent of, <laughs> really, the technology that video games and the computer scientists that work for these video companies uh, shrinking these parts bound. You can think of Xbox One or PlayStation 4, how much smaller they are and how much more they're able to do. It's really these video game companies that are driving this technology to be smaller and more efficient and to use less power. Uh, and so with the advances that they've made, especially over the last five, 10 years, these satellites are able to do more and more. Um, last I heard, there's a fleet of CubeSats that are actively able to transmit um, uh, satellite phone from one side of the planet to another. So they're really able to do most of what the larger satellites are able to do right now. Uh, but because you can have more of them, they'll be able to better cover the planet with their coverage of either phone reception, uh, photography, um, whatever you want, weather prediction from it. So you, you've uh, talked about your, your thruster, but um, you know you, you have to point it in some direction. So tell us about that part of, of your plan. How do you know how you're going to point it? So most satellites use 
Well, there's a couple of different techniques on how we're actually able to point these satellites. We want to get them going in some direction. It, it doesn't really matter. If, if you have the biggest thrust in the world, but you're not pointed at the moon, you're not going to get to the moon. And so for something like this, because it's small, so small, we're able to put multiple of these uh, thrusters, these pulse plasma thrusters, on, on the satellite. So you can imagine we have one pointed off to the left, one pointed off to the right, and then one straight back. Uh, so we're able to fire all three of these to be able to uh, determine which direction that satellite's going to go. I think that's it for me. We can move on to our second speaker. Thank you very much.